Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Whitehouse. I'm the Director of Education and Workforce at the Council of State Government's National Headquarters in Lexington, Kentucky. Uh, we've got a great list of speakers today, but we wanted to go over a little bit of housekeeping on the webinar, that everyone will be in listening only mode, and that if you want, you can type questions in the GoToMeeting box on your screen at any time. And we're going to get to as many questions as we have time for at the end of everyone's presentation. Uh, the webinar audio and the slides will also be posted on the CSG Knowledge Center. And as an attendee, you'll receive an email with a link for the audio and slides. That way you won't have to go hunt for it. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce David D'Arcangelo, who serves as the co-chair of the Transportation, Technology, and Other Employment Support Subcommittee of the National Task Force on Workforce Development for People with Disabilities. David will briefly speak about the task force, and then we'll introduce our first content speaker. David, I turn the Academy over to you. Good afternoon. This is David Darkangel. I'm director of the Massachusetts Office on Disability. And thank you, Elizabeth, and really the entire teams at CSG, NCSL, the entire SEED initiative, for all the great work you've put into this. This has uh, really been a very worthwhile endeavor. I'd also like to thank my co-chair, Nevada Assemblyman Mike Sprinkle. He couldn't join us today, but Mike's been very helpful as well. So uh, the Council on State Governments, or CSG, in partnership with the National Conference of State Legislatures, or NCSL, convened the National Task Force on Workforce Development for People with Disabilities. As leading associations representing state policymakers, CSG and NCSL are uniquely poised to highlight the issue of disability employment at the state level. The National Task Force oversaw the work of four subcommittees, each focusing on a unique policy area impacting the employment of people with disabilities. And those are, number one, career readiness and employability, two, hiring, retention, and reentry, three, entrepreneurship, tax and procurement incentives, and four, technology, transportation, and other employment supports, again, of which I was pleased to co-chair with Assemblyman Sprinkle. Each subcommittee was composed of 10 to 12 state leaders and four to six non-voting external advisors representing the private sector, key stakeholders, and or academia. The members of the leadership of the National Task Force have accomplished much in a very short amount of time. The success of the task force has been to identify policy options to help state leaders move the needle on disability employment policy. And in fact, members of the task force and subcommittees have already signaled policy movement in their respective states. This framework presents a diverse range of elements that can influence the development of policies to improve the workforce for people with disabilities. This report serves as a guide for each of the policy areas the task force explored and is designed to assist states with improving ways the public sector can better serve people with disabilities. This report provides some concrete examples of innovative programs and policies that states are already implementing. And we should also note that a key tenet of this framework was to incorporate and have people with disabilities at the table when policy decisions are being made. These are just a few points about the framework on states of workforce development for people with disabilities. We encourage you to read the full report for more explanation. At this point, I'm going to turn the call back over to Elizabeth, and I'll talk to you in a little bit. Thank you, David. Our first speaker is Dr. Aaron Banger. Aaron serves as the chair of the Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Aaron also served as an advisor to the National Task Force, and I'm really excited for everyone to be able to hear from him today. Aaron? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Good morning if you're on the West Coast. Um, the first thing I want to do is this task force was um, transportation, technology, and other employment support. So it covers a wide range of topics. So any one of these might take an hour by themselves. And we want to cover um, the three areas at some useful level. And so what I want to do is talk about some of the key areas in each of those um, three domains. But before I get started, um, go ahead to the next slide. Before I get started, I want to kind of start with um, a little bit of context and a little bit of definition. Um, the definition of disability 
um, certainly has a legal context. Um, and if we pull from the Americans with Disabilities Act, it's a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities of an individual or a record of such an impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment. Um, it's, a, it's a useful definition and in, in, in the right places um, it's uh, very helpful to be able to refer to that. But thinking about that definition, um, it, it's really a fairly dry legal and clinical definition. Um, it, it's really saying there's something about that person that is limited or broken or not normal. It's not a very humanistic or empowering view of a person. Um, and it really causes, when we start thinking about transportation, but particularly technology, the view often using this view, this, this definition of disability is that it's, it's the role of the designer or developer, the technology or the system to somehow fix or make up some sort of deficit in that person. This is often called the medical model disability because medicine just hasn't figured out a way of making that person whole again. But it's not really accepting that person for who they are. And when we get into the designing and developing of products or services or systems, we really need a different way of thinking about disability. And that other definition is also here, which is disability is a socially created barrier resulting from the mismatch between what a person is capable of and the environment they're in, whether that environment be physical, like a building, a technological, like a website, or an attitudinal environment with other people. And when we think about this definition, the impairment or that limitation of the person um, is not the disability on the in and of itself, unless whatever they're interacting with, whether it be physical, something physically, or something in the digital realm, creates that barrier. And it's because of that interaction. It's only when there are steps into that building that that building is inaccessible to somebody using a wheelchair. If there are no steps into that, that, that use of that wheelchair and the underlying condition is not the disability. Same as when somebody's using a website, when their assistive technology works flawlessly with that, that's, that takes away this concept of a disability. And the reason this is important is it puts the onus not on the person for what they lack. It puts the onus on society for being the main determiner of whether or not uh, there is, that person is experiencing a disability. And so the responsibility really lies on that person or that group or society as a whole to build products, services, systems as a whole to not be disabling. And it's, we will accept the person for who they are and what they are and what they bring to the table. And so <clears throat> before we start talking about some technology and transportation type issues in other areas that can support employment, I want you to kind of approach this with this second mindset, this social model of disability. Whose onus is really to make sure that we're providing accessibility? Is it on the person or is it on us as designers and developers and creators of systems, technologies, uh, and products and services and so forth? Um, go to the next slide. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about transportation now, and, and you can go on to the next slide. Um, I, <clears throat> um, I work, as, as Elizabeth mentioned, uh, as chair of the Texas Governor's Committee, Committee on People with Disabilities. And, and our last, um, our current cycle of policy recommendations, um, there was a great quote in there that I wanted to pull out from a, a resident of Bear County, which is where San Antonio is. And they wrote that ultimately effective transportation proves to be one of the biggest barriers to employment and full participation in the community for people with disabilities. Transportation underlies so many other areas of, of a person with a disability living independently 
and determining for themselves how they want to live. Uh, it affects um, not only workforce, but the ability to um, get to health care services, to get to education, um, to just go out and have fun and be a person, to access the voting booth and other ways of participating in society. When we were developing um, what it would take in our policy recommendations for the National Task Force and our contribution under transportation, we identified several aspects that we really needed to make sure that we were covering. Transportation needs to be accessible. So again, not that we we're make, using transportation to make up for something about a person, but that we are designing that transportation system and the specific elements of that system to not create barriers. It needs to be available. It needs to be reliable. If you need to make it to work on time every time to punch in, um, it's, you're going to have to show up on time every time. It needs to be affordable. It needs to be navigable because transportation is not just one thing. There are lots of elements, and moving um, among and between them is important. It needs to be safe, and it needs to be flexible for both urban environments and the rural environment. Um, to make sure that we're addressing the needs of all users. Next slide. So <clears throat> we had a couple key topics that we wanted to, that I wanted to highlight here, and the full report that will come out during the conference will go into more depth about these as well as some other issues. But um, first and foremost, effective co coordination among all the transportation elements is key. You've got mass transit. You've got paratransit. You have different jurisdictions managing these programs. You've got taxis. You have the new ride-sharing services, the transportation network companies, TNCs. Friends and family are still heavily relied on for providing transportation. How are all these coordinated so that at the end of the day, a person can make it to work on time and get home to their family at a reasonable hour? So. Um, one, one area we talk about are coordinating councils and, and doing a better job of sharing information about um, the needs of riders and uh, the ability for a rider to move among these different ways seamlessly, effortlessly, so they're not caught up in um, uh, problems or um, administrative issues or just being stuck somewhere. Um, without being able to get from point A to point B, which is the purpose of transportation. And we also need to think, rethink the need for physical transportation, not that people with disabilities um, don't need or that should, we should find ways to avoid them from taking physical transportation. But <clears throat> in this day and age, especially with technology, and we'll talk about that here in a minute, are there do we still need, is it still desirable to go from point A to point B? Um, or are there ways to bring employment, recreational opportunities, government services, um, medical, and so forth to that person in, a, in an environment they're comfortable with, um, such as their home? That could be done in lots of different ways, certainly broadband. Uh, High-speed internet is a key foundation of that, but it will require rethinking some of the traditional models of de developing services that have evolved over decades. Another technology we spend a lot of time talking about are autonomous vehicles and how they can be a solution uh, to many of the transportation barriers that people with disabilities face today. But at the same time, if proper planning and forethought is not used, how it could be itself another barrier. Self-driving vehicles opens up independent transportation for people with disabilities and older users who may not be able to still drive or may never have been able to drive uh, because it's now automating that driving process. And um, that person with a disability can use those, right, <clears throat> those autonomous vehicles um, uh, as everybody else will. The shared ownership model of autonomous, that of autonomous vehicles help facilitate may also help make more efficient allocation of vehicles that are designed to meet the needs uh, of users with disabilities. For instance, um, 
when you can pool the resources of having van accessible, um, or excuse me, accessible vans, um, that uh, that may scale much easier than um, <clears throat> what we see today with a, a more owner, uh, direct ownership model. The two important keys here, the accessible technology needs to be baked into the vehicles themselves. So interacting with the vehicle, let's say setting destination, needs to be accessible. If it's accessible on your smartphone today, there's no reason it can't be accessible uh, in the vehicle. And that one of the key things here is that the input by people with disabilities is important to make sure these services are built accessible that accessibility is thought of from the very beginning so that we get to a fully realized new technology that is accessible from the beginning and accessibility doesn't have to be retrofitted. Next slide. Um, I want to um, alert you to a study that we just completed in Texas on accessible parking. Our legislature gave us uh, on the Governor's Committee an interim study to look at um, addressing issues of accessible parking, um, and really accessible parking today is a, is a key way for individuals with disabilities to continue to fully participate in their community. And the three of the biggest issues that we came across were the illegal use of spaces and lack of enforcement of people improperly using those spaces, uh, insufficient spaces being available, especially at medical centers. Uh, and in particular, uh, lack of van accessible spaces or people um, using van accessible spaces that didn't necessarily need um, that option. And lastly, fraud and ab abuse of parking placards and plates. So um, if, you, um, if you find, just Google Texas Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities, you'll see on our front page we have a link to that report and a lot of great research that it went into it and the full set of recommendations that went with that. So next slide. Um, let's talk about technology now. Now, uh, technology is an extremely broad subject, um, but I'm going to really start with a common myth when it comes to making technology accessible for people with disabilities, and that is if you make it accessible, then it's really boring and actually worse for people without disabilities to use that same technology. There was a research study earlier this year in a refereed journal uh, the journal is called Human Factors, and it looked at this exact problem. Let's let's manipulate in controlled conditions, accessible versus low accessible and very low accessibility conditions of websites, and let's find out how did people do with that, and what did people perceive about that from a, a preference standpoint. And they found both a higher level of performance of so being able to complete your task on time, let's say booking a reservation or something as well as improved aesthetic qualities, perceived ratings, trustworthiness, and overall usability compared to low usability websites. So um, <clears throat> there may be a perception that accessible technology is somehow less um, cool than, um, than fully accessible technology, but it doesn't stand up to scrutiny. And go on to the next slide, please. So let's talk about accessible technology in the workplace. Um, there are several trends that we could take a lot of time um, talking about, but just a few here um, that are helping improve accessibility um, for people in, um, in the workplace. So the bring your own device movement, if, a, if you as a person with a disability have figured out how to use your smartphone or tablet or other um, device, You've got all the assistive technology, you have all the settings that are just the way you want them, and then you have to go to work and you're given a piece of inaccessible technology that you have to spend days trying to get right and, and maybe not even have access to the tools and resources you are to use. It may be a much better and efficient way of saying, can I just use the same device for the work I do? Um, there are obviously some challenges with that approach especially from an IT privacy and security side, but many businesses are doing it and can help uh, ease that transition for people with disabilities. Going to software defined and cloud enabled <clears throat> tools um, helps uh, because that's a lot more accessible 
um, than uh, more traditional technologies. Using collaboration technologies like this, web conferencing with chat and instant messaging, um, video conferencing and so forth, the more mobile and virtual office um, type choices uh, really allow flexibility. And flexibility is one of the keys to accessibility. So um, I've got some logos up here from Pete, from Jan, from the USBLN. They'll provide really good resources to help go into more depth about these topics. We really should be viewing accessible technology not as just a reasonable accommodation, but as productivity tools. It makes everybody in the workplace more productive to have these tools available. Um, there's a link here to creating accessible uh, Microsoft Office documents. Uh, this is an award-winning program that the state of Texas has done. We've just updated for Office 2013 and 16. Um, Go ahead to the uh, next slide, please. So that was kind of in the workplace at a kind of a, a tactical level. What are some of the bigger uh, concepts going on? I want to talk about two. One is broadband. I mentioned that earlier as being a way that can change some of the transportation paradigms we have. Broadband really helps support telework, telemedicine, telehealth. Video calling, this is especially important um, for American Sign Language users who can allow them to communicate in their native language, ASL. It's not just for grandparents wanting to talk to their grandkids from far away. Self-service government. Um, I love this quote um, from a paper that's a few years ago. Um, David, you mentioned Jonathan Lazar from Towson State University. Um, that paper said, uh, most of today's technologies are digital, meaning they are made up of zeros and ones. And there's nothing inherently inaccessible about zeros and ones. It goes back to that definition of disability. It's about making sure that we don't create the barriers in technology. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, this concept of, of TTYs. We don't use them that much anymore because, frankly, technologies pass them by. But if you look at a lot of the uh, regulatory requirements, it still specifies the use of TTYs, even though they're invented over 50 years ago based on teletype machines that were even then ancient. There's a new technology coming on the market called real-time text. And it's a, it does functionally the same thing. It allows a conversation in text form for individuals with disabilities in conjunction with making and receiving voice calls. But it's based on internet protocol. It's based on modern technology. The FCC is currently looking at regulations. The industry is looking at finalizing standards for this. And the key thing from a state standpoint is real-time text is part of the next generation 911 standards. And so the faster we can move to next generation 911, the faster we're going to allow individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing or have speech disabilities to make and receive calls using modern technology rather than old TTYs. Go on to the next slide. Um, the last thing I want to talk about are other employment supports. And on the last slide here, um, go ahead and next slide. Um, a couple things on housing. Um, from a high-level planning standpoint, livable communities is a concept that might include complete streets and mixed-use development and transit-oriented development, and a lot of these other terms. But the basic idea is how, um, how are we setting up uh, our communities to be inclusive of people with disabilities and as people age and acquire disabilities, transitioning them um, and so there's a concept called universal design that basically says we need to design both the physical environment as well as the digital technology environment in a way that incorporates the widest range of users and needs possible. And so um, this will allow work from home, multi-generational living, that will allow caregivers um, to be local right there, whether you're taking care of a child with a disability or you're taking care of parents with a disability to evolve the home as needed um, to uh, support accessibility and visitability, that is, the ability for people with disabilities to visit homes. Disability is often acquired through life, just it's part of the human condition. And so for the most part, people's preferences are to stay in their home. Uh, in Texas, we have the Amy Young Burial Removal Program that can give grants to people to help modify their homes so they can stay in them after they've acquired a disability. Um, we also need, and we're going to talk about in the report, supporting policies that foster technology to enable aging in place and home automation. Last thing I want to talk about um, is a, a 
a, a initiative that's going on right now, started last year called Teach Access. And they're looking, how do you expand the knowledge of technologists, people in the STEM field, on how to build accessible technology? And they're really looking both at a supply and a demand perspective. That is, including on the supply side, accessibility and universal design principles in the curricula of technology fields so that the people graduating actually know how to build accessible technology. And then second, on a demand side, is incorporating into job descriptions there is a stated preference for accessibility knowledge. So if you're hiring a web designer or a product developer to say, it's preferred that you understand how to do that accessibly so that we increase demand for um, people with those skills. And both of those go together. So Teach Access, very important initiative to build the infrastructure needed to, ma to make all this technology accessible. Um, so last slide, just some um, contact information um, for me if you need, want to get in touch with me after the call. Elizabeth, I'll turn it back over to you. Erin, thank you so much. And for folks that might have questions for Erin, um, we're going to uh, take all of those questions after all of our speakers that have uh, provided their presentations, but you can submit your questions in the GoTo meeting box on your screen. Our next speaker is Jeff Klein, who's the Program Director of the Statewide Electronic and Information Resources with the Texas Department of Information Resources. And Jeff also served as an advisor to the National Task Force on Workforce Development for People with Disabilities. And I was really excited to, to have him join us as well, and he's got a great presentation. Uh, uh, specifically on a lot of things that they're getting to do and what he's seeing in this field. Seth, I will uh, hand it over to you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, good good afternoon or good morning to anybody out on the on the uh, East Coast. So I'm going to drill in a little bit into this uh, this IT issue, and if we go to the next slide. Um, Pretty much everyone in the world, whether you're a government entity, whether you're a private sector, or whether you are an individual, um, most of the things that you buy, related, most of the things that you use in IT are things that are procured, whether it be a piece of hardware or a piece of software. And so that really holds true uh, with regards to the, the public uh, sector. Um, you know, most of the IT that uh, is used in in the public sector is is procured by different uh, different companies, etc. Now, the the painful truth of the matter is is most of the products and services that are out there in the IT world today, although many of them have made uh, are making a good effort, they don't comply to these accessibility standards that have been established that will pretty much allow people with uh, disabilities to access IT in a meaningful way to be able to accomplish the same kinds of things uh, that somebody in the general population can. So, and when that happens, uh, obviously it creates barriers um, for both employees of these government entities as well as the citizens who have to access that IT to do things. And um, not only does it create barriers, but it also creates risk to the organizations because of the, uh, the, the complaints that get filed and the protections that, that people with uh, disabilities have under, under the ADA. So, um, and unfortunately, um, we really don't see that changing in the foreseeable future. There's going to continue to be a high dependency on IT uh, procured products and services. Uh, we don't see everybody just deciding to uh, develop everything themselves. Although, you know, websites, uh, a lot of uh, entities do tend to develop their own websites. Um, and so that, that, that's one of the uh, potential uh, positive areas. Okay, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about this. Why is it, uh, what's the problem? Well, you can break it down into the technical barriers versus what I call the governance barriers. Now, from a technology perspective, there's been a lot of advancements in accessibility technology over the past uh, 10 years. 
there are new tools, there's better technologies um, that allow uh, developers the ability to create accessible products and services in a um, you know in a meaningful way. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't still technical challenges out there. There are uh, in a number of places, um, and some of that kind of relates back to the um, you know legacy products and things like that. But there's a pretty good body of knowledge out there on on how to do it, and that body of knowledge is growing. However, where we get into the into the weeds a little bit is most organizations who produce technology lack the commitment, and even if they ha are committed to do it, sometimes they don't really know what to do and how to do it because there's a lot of moving parts to help uh, make products and services accessible. So they lack the governance for uh, uh, accessible IT, and those are still creating significant obstacles in the, uh, in the industry, in the IT industry. So accessibility has been around um, in the, from a legal perspective, back in 2000, when uh, the federal government issued uh, U.S. Section 508 requiring federal agencies to make or procure accessible products, and they came out with a set of accessibility standards, the Section 508 technical standards, um, <clears throat> and then there's uh, WCAG uh, 2.0, which is the new one. 508 is adopting that from the World Wide Web Consortium. The problem is, is pushing these technical standards and trying to drive everybody to them, especially uh, the, the uh, vendors who, who produce IT, it just has not been an adequate adoption driver because we've seen the adoption across the industry being very slow. So, you know, these technical standards, um, what people fail to, uh, to grasp, but these are really uh, they're execution criteria, and they're not governance criteria. So, you know, while you can execute against those standards if you choose to, there's nothing out there that tells you, you know, what are the overarching parameters that you can put in place within an organization to help you make that happen. There's nothing in the technical standards today uh, that address governance. Uh, 508 today is pretty much, uh, you know, mostly the technical stuff. Uh, WCAG, you know, they have some information out there on their website, but they don't really, um, they don't really, um, uh, it's not included as a, as a specification in any way. And, you know, there's no silver bullet on the technology that's going to magically make all this stuff accessible over the, over the next uh, 10 or 20 years, although there, there are a few things happening uh, out there in the world that are, that are clearly helping in that, in that regard. Next slide, please. So if you look at how some of these problems are being addressed both uh, proactively and then um, uh, through disruption, um, I've got four types of things here. And through various sources, for example, the Office of Management Budget, uh, I think in 2012, uh, published a strategic plan for improving the management of uh, US Section 508. And if you look out onto the other side of the chart, that, that strategic plan included policy requirements that agencies had to have requirements uh, of policy, um, skills and training. They had to make sure they had skills in place and had training programs, you know, the ability to report back how they're progressing, and then organizational process and planning things. And um, so if you look at those four key elements, and then you go across in uh, one of the, uh, in statute, the province uh, of Ontario uh, published a, a rule called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, AOTA. Some folks may have heard of it. Those same four uh, key elements are included in that. And then when you drill down just a little bit more and you look at some of the uh, litigation uh, that's been going on, where the even where the Department of, of Justice has actually been intervening in some of these accessibility lawsuits, you see the same things that are coming into the settlement, right? You know, these we want these, um, you know, the, you know, the the um, folks where these complaints are being filed to have policy and skills, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I just wanted to. So what we're seeing here is we're, you know. 
in all these individual places, people are starting to understand that these are the components that an organization has to have in order to correct their deficiencies and to build accessible products and services. Next slide, please. So we came up with this idea where we kind of formalized that with a few other things called Policy Driven Adoption for Accessibility or PDAA. And what this is, is it's a method for the integration of IT accessibility governance into organizational policies so that these organizations are driving themselves to improve uh, accessibility adoption. Uh, so rather than you know beating everybody up over their VPATs and the technical criteria, you know by by driving them to have policy with certain things in it, we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, this kind of makes IT accessibility difficult uh, for uh, for vendors or other organizations to ignore. The idea being, if you have a policy in place and you implement your own policies, then over time you will improve. Uh, and you're going to implement that policy to a high degree. Uh, it's not prescriptive like uh, like VPATs, et cetera. It tells them what to do, not how to do it. Uh, it can be governed through non-technical methods, so you don't need a lot of sophisticated tools to to measure it. And it can really accelerate uh, marketplace inter, uh, innovation. I kind of use the analogy with uh, you know the um, uh, emission standards or the fuel mileage standards, where the whole industry gets into an uproar, they're not going to do it, and they push back a lot, and then they finally settle out and they get into it and they, they make policies in their companies and they, they start to go implement and that drives a lot of innovation and now we've got you know, uh, amazing uh, uh, assortment of alternative fuel cars, uh, etc. So that's kind of what policy-driven adoption is. If we go to the next slide. So we launched a work group through the National Association of State CIOs back in uh, 2013. And uh, the work group was uh, represented with 10 states and one uh, federal agency. Uh, the, the program was kind of um, uh, championed by uh, our state CIO, Karen Robinson, at the time. And we had representation from uh, all these, uh, these states, 10 states, and uh, as well as the Federal Consumer Protection Bureau. And the objectives were to develop a set of a uh, common set of, of PDAA criteria um, and measure and develop the supporting deliverables that would help uh, vendors assess that and, and map their, uh, their progress and then package it up as a, 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 an adoption model for other states. The idea being that if we had one consistent way to do this and we could replicate that across multiple states, then um, it would kind of uh, mitigate one of the pain points that many, uh, especially large uh, vendors, seem to have because uh, one entity, a state or a country or a city is asking them for one set of things and, and uh, another state is asking them for something a little bit different, so there's just another, another level of effort that goes in. So what we wanted to really try to do is come up with a standardized set. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So the core criteria that we established were really kind of um, uh, divided into six areas. So first of all, the creation of a policy. You know, every organization, and it could be the vendor organizations or government organizations, should develop, implement, and maintain an ICT accessibility policy. So that becomes the overarching um, the overarching thing that will drive an organization and then you know implementing that the kind of the, the devil's in the details but but some of the other pieces in the core criteria are the pieces that help drive that so there's also an organizational component to this and the reason there is is uh, we see a lot of tactical things going on uh, in the uh, in the industry where uh, you know somebody has an accessibility guy tucked into an organization somewhere, and they're fixing their company's website, et cetera. But you know, if that guy gets hit by a bus or he retires or something like that, they they lose all the uh, the momentum. So the idea is that you establish and maintain an organizational structure, uh, you know, based on the scale of the company, of course, or the organization, 
that facilitates progress in accessibility. So it lives on beyond any particular individual or set of individuals. And then a very important piece uh, that's lacking in a lot of places is the integration of accessibility criteria into key phases of key processes. So that could be the uh, product development process or the web development process, uh, procurement, uh, acquisitions, and uh, you know any other relevant process where uh, IT accessibility could play a role. And then the next uh, element is uh, relates to well, how do you plan uh, your products? You know you have some that are accessible today, some are on a path to be accessible, and what do you do up until that time? So you know do you have plans in place for addressing the deficiencies in accessibility if somebody needs to to use that product? And that can be it could be something like an 800 number. Uh, there, there are there could be an alternate screen, alternate means of access. There's a number of ways to address that. And then, of course, uh, making sure that uh, organizations have availability of the correct accessibility skills, either within the organization, which is always best, or to the organization um, via consulting. And then the last thing is making that information available. Uh, re relative to the accessibility policy plans and progress to your customers when they when they ask for it, so that they can use that to gauge the confidence that you will that your that an organization is committed to uh, you know to making accessible products and services. So if you look at this list, you can really kind of see how these things go back and map to those imperatives that we saw in that last uh, table of converged uh, governance models. The next slide, please. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but uh, in addition to the core criteria, we developed a maturity model that uh, kind of divides into into three um, three states. The launch date, which is the you know the first phase where you you recognize you need accessibility policy and you you know you're going to go start on those things, and then the integrate where you're working on on those things uh, you know to make them more uh, you know, to solidify them, and then the optimized state is when you've got every all the <clears throat> all the correct pieces in place, and you're just doing things to incrementally improve or change, uh, you know, as needed. And along the bottom of this, what you see is there's a little uh, bar chart, and um, that's the bar chart from a questionnaire that we send out today with all of our uh, uh, procurements, and my. Um, my agency does cooperative contracts or master contracts for the state of Texas. And so when we issue an RFO, it's going to be, we have a very large number of, of vendors that respond, and then in, in most cases, and then we'll select a, a subset of those to enter into contracts with. So as part of these solicitation packages go out, we send them a questionnaire, a vendor self-assessment. It asks them all these questions that kind of map to this maturity model. And as they go down and they respond to that thing, it'll populate that bar chart and show them where they are in the maturity model. Um, the idea being is uh, we can use that within the state of Texas, um, you know, to ask or to again gain confidence in the vendor's ability to to do things. But it's a little bit of a a, a subtle way of saying this is important. Um, See, see where you are in this, and you can use this uh, questionnaire as a guide to, you know, to, to understand what you need to do, like implement a policy and get the skills on board and integrate and, and all of those things. So it kind of serves a, a dual purpose. The next slide, please. So we've put this into practice. Like I said, uh, the vendors are required to complete it, and we've we've had over. Uh, well over 200 vendors at this point completing uh, completing the assessment. Uh, not always uh, a perfect uh, a perfect response, but but they are looking at it. Now the interesting thing, and what we tell the vendors today, is we don't score the results as part of the contract award criteria. So there's other parameters that procurement here uses, uh, and, and as of now, the PDAA score is not um, included in that. Uh, but we do record the results, and we can compare those uh, to responses and subsequent <coughs> solicitations, contract renewals, and um, 
you know, if over time we don't see any movement from a particular vendor, like they just say, no, we, you know, it's three years later, we still don't have a policy, we're not doing anything about it, it could affect their ability to make a, uh, you know, to get a contract with the state of Texas. So we, we kind of make that clear at the same time. Um, and, uh, <clears throat> and then we also have a mechanism in place to, uh, to make those results available to customers. We've got a, a report that we can provide that uh, gives them information on uh, kind of that bar chart rating on, on the latest response from the customer and also kind of an overview of the uh, other accessibility documents that, um, that they've, they've sent in. So uh, on this page, I don't know whether these are going to go out in a hard copy or not, but there's a uh, uh, NASIO uh, published a, a set of briefing papers, a two-part on briefing papers on PDAA. Uh, I would encourage everybody who's interested to go out there and look at it. It, it really gives more of this uh, in depth than I'm able to do in the, in the few minutes that I have. And then there's also a link to the um, PDAA information on, on our uh, DIR site, including the, the questionnaire and also some, uh, a couple of other forms that we might use uh, uh, to supplement that, um, to ask other questions about a customer's ability to, uh, to create accessible IT. For example, uh, if, if you're buying development services, um, you know, you might want to ask them questions, you know, do you have, what tools do you use to create your, uh, you know, your, your websites? Um, you know, do you have any, can you provide us some, uh, some example websites that you've done in the past and you can point us to the, to the, um, to where they are? Do you have a policy? Can you point us to the policy? So kind of using that to, to, to help gain confidence in a, in a uh, vendor's ability to produce accessible IT for us. I think that is my last slide. I didn't put a fancy one in there like Aaron did with my picture and all that other information. I, I apologize. But I will turn it back over to uh, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and I know that uh, David, you've got some great uh, thoughts that the task force subcommittee had on transportation, technology, and other employment supports and the strategies uh, that your subcommittee uh, came up with to address some of the policy areas that Aaron and Jeff talked about. Um, can I hand it over to you again? Thanks, Elizabeth, and great job, Aaron and Jeff. And, uh, I want to be sure to move this along to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. But really, from when we started into Chicago to going to Washington, D.C., having that meeting, and now on to Williamsburg, uh, we've had tremendous talent displayed here. And really, uh, my question to you to start this is to everybody on the call, who will put these initiatives into action? That's where leadership comes in, and that's really what I'd like to have the theme for my segment being. You can go to the next slide here. So really what CSG and NCSL did was, uh, I would consider not a report, this is going to become the report. Really, if you, if you went around and you spent uh, a couple of weeks on your own going in depth and uh, having, having people on your team help you to go and look at each state and all the things going on, well really, that's what's ended up in this Work Matters, a framework for states on workforce development for people with disabilities, the report. Uh, and the subcommittees, from career readiness and employability to the hiring, retention, entrepreneurship, tax incentives, and our subcommittee of technology, transportation, and other employment supports. I think we pretty much scoured the entire country. And if there's a program we missed, it's only because uh, it, it came in after we started our work. So really, uh, all of the elements of policies throughout the country are, are demonstrated here. And uh, really, it's a credit to the leadership of our task force, the national co-chairs, Delaware Governor Jack Markell and Nebraska Senator uh, Bo McCoy, really. And, and the co-chairs from each subcommittee, uh, big thanks to them. You can go to the next slide. Uh, really, the guiding principles were that uh, disability is a natural part of the human experience. And there were people with disabilities involved with the group, which was a tenant of uh, our, our principles going forward, and I think that really informed the work of the task force. And, and we know that disability it can develop at any time during somebody's life. Nobody volunteers to be disabled. Nobody wants to join that group, yet it can happen at any point in time. 
We know that disability uh, comes more with age, so we we were cognizant of that, and you know we really embrace the nothing about us without us principle, and that is including people with disabilities and and formulating this and really again I go back to who will put these initiatives into action. It can't be just persons with disabilities. It can't be just people without the disabilities. It's got to be both. So uh, we really believe that people with disabilities are underutilized. I mean, there's a ton of talent out there that's untapped. And think of what that could be turned into for our states, for our country. And people with disabilities, they, we know they have valuable and unique contributions to make. Right here in Boston with Alexander Graham Bell, would the phone have started as quickly had his parents not been deaf? If you can go to the next uh, slide. So really, uh, as a state policy official, we want to convey that you can convey to your agenda setters, opinion leaders, and everybody else in leadership positions that everyone benefits when people with disabilities are in the workforce. Uh, not only are they less likely to then be getting services, which are oftentimes very costly, but more importantly, they're, they're contributing to the bottom line, especially when we can make employment meaningful. And Really, at the end of the day, what we want is persons with disabilities to be independent. We want them to be uh, self-determining. That's really what one of the whole major parts of the disability movement is. And I would assert that there's really not much more to uh, self-determining and, and dignity than having gainful employment. And we know that the labor force uh, gains workers with valuable skills by employing people with disabilities. That's well documented, and we know that. Uh, we, at the same time right now, are undergoing a tremendous challenge. Nearly two-thirds of working-age persons with disabilities are not in the labor force. So we have a two-step challenge. One, let's get those persons with disabilities into the labor force. Two, once they're in the labor force, let's make sure they're gainfully employed. Because we know that states with gainful, high levels of gainfully or higher levels of gainfully employed persons with disabilities have better economic outcomes. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So really, uh, the work of the committee centered around employment-related supports. And uh, my two colleagues here did a great job going over uh, some of the transportation technology and assistive technology and emergent technologies. They're two of the best in the country here. So you can go to the next slide. What we want to do is make sure that uh, technical assistance is available for employers and businesses and whether it be corporations or small business that they know what is available to them whether it be tax incentives and, and barrier removal things like that uh, or what other uh, programs your state government may have in place to be able to support them from transitioning people with disabilities into work and, and sometimes it's rudimentary things like de developing data and information that you can pass on to make connections. Oftentimes in the colleges, what we found out is the career services people, they're not necessarily talking to the disability services people. Sometimes it can be just making that connection uh, and really going into uh, making sure that disability is part of the diversity and inclusion policies within organizations as well. Uh, convene a task force like we did. Do that in your own state. Take action. Let people know that this is important. Uh, and really, I think one of the most successful things that this report does is it will help you coordinate strategies and, and really supports for what other states are doing. You don't have to be uh, a complete you know, leader in everything. I mean, other states are doing good things. You can look at them and see what they're doing and maybe copy that and, and bring it into your state. Uh, you can go to the next page. Next slide. Accessibility transportation is really important, and we know that the built environments, especially around here in the Northeast and places that are uh, older parts of our community, uh, it's a challenge. So we've got to make sure that any workforce development efforts incorporates and thinks of persons with disabilities when you're doing that. If you can't get to work, you could have the best skills in the world, but you're never going to be able to get that job. So how can we bring down barriers? whether they be in transportation, technology, uh, or in architecture, what can we do to make sure we're physically and programmatically getting opportunities and access for persons with disabilities? 
So we want to ensure that transportation is available and accessible. And those are two very different words. I know we had some breakout conversation about that. People in transportation divisions sometimes like to use accessible when they actually mean available. We want to make sure they're both accessible, meaning persons with disabilities can access them easily, and available, meaning that they're readily uh, available and on time and things like that. You go to the next slide. Uh, we've got some great examples displayed throughout the report, a couple here. Wyoming addresses statewide and rural transportation access needs for workers with disabilities for regional transportation voucher programs. That's probably going to encompass uh, 30 out of the 50 states anyway. So, you know, if you're in one of those states, you could look at that as a model. Uh, regional voucher programs are operated by the Wyoming Independent Living Center and the Wyoming Independent Living Rehab services for independent living with funding supported by the state. So you can see that it's a network and you can talk to the folks out there to see how they put it together. And again, maybe you can model that in your state to be able to increase transportation there. You can go to the next slide. Uh, so really what we're encouraging is states to adopt policies that support accessibility in the workforce uh, and workplace, particularly related to accessible information and communication technologies or ICT and assistive technologies. Really that programmatic access is key and I mean so much of the world today, the professional world particularly, is reliant upon technology. Uh, certainly if I were to ask you, is the internet going to be bigger now or in five years? I think everybody here would say five years. So when's the best time to plant the tree? It's right now. So the quicker you can get states to adopt policies that promote accessible information communication technologies, the better it is for persons with disabilities and more importantly the state workforce. Go to the next slide. Another great example, Alabama's IT universal accessibility standard. It specified that just as environmental obstacles can inhibit individuals with certain disabilities, internet use can also present obstacles for persons with certain disabilities. And the object of the policy is to advise agencies on the use of the minimum requirements for online accessibility for all state of Alabama websites to comply with Section 508 of the Rehab Act. So, uh, you know, making sure that your state has things like the VPAT and is up to speed on WCAG and the poor, uh, you know, the poor principles and 508. Having that and bringing people into that dialogue, making them aware of that and leading them down that path, oftentimes, as Aaron pointed out in his slide, you're going to get not only uh, just as good, you're oftentimes going to get a more robust experience by incorporating accessibility into your website and, and other electronic documents. You go to the next slide. So really, we're asking that states enact policies that support worker access to the built environment, including housing, public transportation, infrastructure, physical design. So, I mean, that's a big thing. So really, I mean, just think of when you wake up every morning and, and you roll over, you hit that alarm, and you're getting ready to go. What does that involve? You need reliable housing, public transportation, and other infrastructure just to get to work. So in that chain, think of all of the potential barriers that could be. And I would encourage you to think not just about the little uh, guy on the universal access symbol in the wheelchair a little person there. It's about all of the prevalence types. So what about the person with an intellectual disability? What about the person with a visual challenge or a, a, an auditory challenge? It's about all of the prevalence types and really thinking outside from the 50,000 foot view of how we can bring barriers down and promote access and opportunity. Can go to the next slide. Another great uh, example of States in Action, Massachusetts, we have a home modification loan program, and it provides for up to $30,000 in lower interest, low or no interest loans for the purposes of making accessibility modifications. And in some cases, the loan can be given under a deferred payment plan. So, I mean, really, then you're only repaying it when the property gets sold. So this is an example of what can we do to bring down barriers? What can we do to make sure we're giving people access and opportunity to be successful for work and be ready for work. Next slide. So really, uh, I've turned this back over to Elizabeth, but I would end with uh, who will put these initiatives into action? 
that's where leadership comes in. That's where we need people to step up. So thank you for allowing me to present here, and I'll turn it back over to Elizabeth. Well, thank you so much, David and Aaron and Jess. I think that I'm so excited for our time together in Williamsburg, and I know that we received a couple of questions, um, and I don't know how much time we have left, but um, David, maybe you can uh, quickly tell us, I think we had one on what was the most innovative employment support that you've seen in your role with the Office of, uh, uh, excuse me, Office of Disability in Massachusetts uh, leading uh, that office. What have you seen as the most innovative uh, practice with employment support? Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, it's David. So in transportation, we have a couple, and then well, I'll mention another one in technology, too. So in transportation, we have a very innovative pilot program with our public transit um, and our on-demand public transit ride-sharing companies between Uber and Lyft. So really what we've done is we have here uh, the MBTA, the Massachusetts Bay Transportation Authority, is really our public transit system here in the Commonwealth. And traditionally, they've been operating on an on-demand system for persons with disabilities called the ride. Well, we figured out that it was costing about $90 round trip to be able to provide one ride user. And so we said, wait a minute, that's just breaking the bank. We went to the ride-sharing companies, Uber and Lyft, and we said, hey, how can we figure this out? And now we're doing a pilot program. The costs are significantly lower, and the user experience has increased greatly. So that's an excellent example of, of innovation of a public-private partnership that's working well. If anybody wants more information on that, uh, please email me uh, or contact me. We also have a Blind Ways app, again, through the MBTA. That's a collaboration between Perkins School for the Blind and the MBTA that is placing uh, geotags at bus stops. So what it's doing is it's using GPS technology on your smartphone to really make hyper-accurate determination of where bus stops are. So blind and low vision users can have uh, really up to the foot uh, measurement of where their bus stop is. So those are two in transportation. One I'd touch upon briefly in technology is we just did uh, ITS 61, which is our procurement of state accessibility here for any of the uh, Commonwealth agencies and or uh, cities and towns in Massachusetts. So they accessibility uh, for their IT products and services. So those are a few things that we're doing here in Massachusetts that are innovative and we're really excited about. No, that's a lot. Um, thank you all so much for joining us as speakers. I know that I wanted to note for everyone that uh, as attendees, you'll receive an email with a link that will have the slides and audio from the webinar as they're posted on CSG's Knowledge Center. And again, I would encourage everyone to join us on December 8th um, so you can hear more from Jess, uh, Aaron, and David, uh, our experts in this area, as well as uh, Assemblyman Sprinkle, and we'll be able to cover the rest of the great work of the task force. Uh, gentlemen, thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you spending your time with us this afternoon. Thank you, everyone.